So, uh, last night, over 300 rockets, missiles, left Iran flying towards Israel, specifically even Jerusalem. The tension is increasing. I did a live radio show this morning talking about what does it mean, where do we go from here, how do we respond as a nation. I shared with you this emerging Cold War that is fought by proxy wars. And the reality is that there's a level of tension in the region that we haven't seen in a while. We could talk about reasons why we're at this point question is, what do we do moving forward? And what do these leaders do as they are challenged to satisfy their constituencies and at the same time not take us into global war? Israel is the center of biblical prophecy and biblical history. Our eschatological notions are around what happens in that particular region. I'm not going to talk about this today. That was a teaser. But we will unpack this so we'll understand some of the geopolitical forces that are at work and how we as Christians should understand it and engage it. Is that all right with you? Yes. Praise the Lord. But that won't be today. Today, I'd like to continue our theme, this year's theme, courage. We've talked about courage to do a lot of things. It takes courage to admit need. It takes courage to ask for help. It takes courage to seize opportunities. And we've gone through a list of things around the word courage. We looked at Joshua. We looked at Moses. Contrasted their leadership context and how they responded to the call of leadership. But in continuing with the whole idea of courage and our definition of courage is not just the capacity to persevere in the face of danger and challenges and opposition. But we understand courage as the alignment of our mind, will, and emotions in order to face challenges and opposition. Because a divided house, Jesus said, can't stand. And there are times when your mind is in one direction, your emotions are in another direction, and your will is being challenged by those two opposing directions. How many have ever been here? Turn to your neighbor and say, he's preaching about you already. It's all over your face. <laughs> so you really can't engage in the kind of courage necessary to take on challenges, to seize opportunities, etc., if there's not that alignment. Mind what you're thinking and how you're thinking. Your will, the choices that you're making. And your emotions, how you feel about the things that you are facing. So today, in the time that we don't have left, I'd like to talk about courage in this way. Because if you're going to be successful in life, if you're going to manage the stresses of life, 
you're going to have to make hard decisions that will take courage, strength. So today I want to talk to you about courage to set boundaries. Jesus practiced the spatiality of relationships. All relationships are spatial. I shared with you the bullseye. I'm not an artist, so I appreciate your grace. If we were to create a bullseye, you know the target, with you in the middle. And this is review for some of you, some of you, your first time. But I want to use this to open the conversation. So let's say we put you in the middle. People in your life occupy certain spaces in your life in proximity to you at the center. So people can be anywhere within these spaces. Who occupies what space can be for many reasons, but intentionally, people should occupy a space in your life that's close to you because there's a purpose and or they have the level of maturity needed to occupy that space. Because the closer people are in proximity to you, in your center, the center of your life, right? The more they know about you, the more they see you. And not everybody can handle that kind of information. Not everyone can handle the real you. <laughs> Turn to your neighbor and say I, say, I told you he was preaching to you already. <laughs> How many understand what I'm talking about? Because, you know, uh, uh, people, people can see us from a distance. And then judge us based upon what they can perceive at that distance. They can come to certain conclusions, make certain assumptions about us. But as they get closer, most people look good at a distance. But as the distance decreases, you begin to make out certain details, <laughs> certain features. And maybe you can't handle that detail. So life in terms of relationships is about managing spaces. Who do you have where and why? Who do you have where and why? If you have someone close to you and you're not conscious of their level of maturity and they're occupying that space, if you're not conscious of their level of maturity and if that level is not where it needs to be in order to occupy that space close to you, their immaturity is going to show up. And it's going to show up in a way that can be detrimental. 
So you have to be critical of the spaces in your life and the people who occupy those spaces. I, have a, I, I tell you a story. I've shared it from time to time. Young man, uh, uh, you know, early on in church, and, you know, he just, I, Pastor, I love you, just appreciate you so much. And you got to let me take you to lunch. I, I just want to sit down and talk with you. I said, no. <laughs> so first he had to get over my directness. He said, no. <laughs> where do you want me to take? Where do you want to go? Have, I said, no. He couldn't believe that I would say no. Or maybe he couldn't believe I'll say it, I said it so quickly. <laughs> but the reason I said no, and he asked me, he said, well, why not? I said, you got to understand, when I, when I go out to have a meal, I want to enjoy the meal. <laughs> and sometimes you can enjoy the meal, but then the meal loses its enjoyment because of the company. I said, I'm going to be honest with you. You are of a critical spirit. So to go to lunch with you is going to be work. Because I'm going to be trying my best to be on my best behavior, to watch what I say, watch what I do, because I'm going to be conscious that you're going to be judging me by every little thing. I don't want to go to lunch like that. He said, no, no, pastor, that's not true. I said, no, 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 it's true. I said, I'm sorry. I don't mean to hurt you, but I've got to manage spaces. It takes courage to be honest with someone like that. It takes courage to establish boundaries to protect you. And it's not that someone may be maliciously trying to hurt you, but because they need to grow more, they really don't know how to conduct themselves in a particular space. I appreciate this word, and maybe you should too. Decorum is your ability to conduct yourself in the right manner, based upon the space that you're occupying, the situation, the circumstance, etc. And there's some wonderful people who just lack decorum. How many, don't point, how many know some people like that? We live life on levels, we arrive in stages, we experience life in seasons. And as we move from one level to another, one stage to another, one season to another, not everyone is growing with us. And if people are not growing with you and you keep them in that space, then it can undermine your own growth and what that growth is accomplishing. This is a hard conversation. That's why it takes courage to set boundaries. So pastor, what do you do if you have a person who is occupying a space in your life close to you because you know, you've known them for a long time, they've been there for a long time, but you find that, 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 that you, you've outgrown them and they haven't grown with you and your life experience, you know, and, and they're still at a different level. I say there are three R's. Not reading, writing, and arithmetic. Maybe you can retrain them. Maybe they have the capacity to grow, but they just haven't focused on growth. Maybe, because I like to think redemptively first, especially in this cancel culture, because folks will cancel you in a minute. So I like to think redemptively, 
can, can I retrain this individual to bring them to the place where they can occupy this space? And when you think about retraining someone, you also have to think about what it's going to cost you in time, in effort. Can I retrain them? And with some people, the answer is no. There's something called the Peter Principle. And that simply means that people will ascend to the level of their capacity. So if they can do 10 things, they do it excellent. But you give them 11, they fall apart. So that's their capacity. Well, you don't know. Look, Jesus said some will bear fruit. Some 30-fold, some 60-fold, some 100-fold. I've learned to manage my expectations. I don't expect 100-fold from a 30-fold person. And nothing against them because, remember, disappointment is never based upon what you find. It's always based upon what you expected to find. So manage your expectations. You manage your disappointment. And I have to understand a person's capacity in dealing with them so I can know what to expect from them and what not to expect from them. Because you can get mad at them for not performing at the level of your expectation. And that's not fair to them. So, if you can't retrain them, you may have to reposition them. I just can't encounter you or fellowship with you or have you in these spaces of my life anymore because you haven't grown and developed. You, you know, you just, it's not good, it's not healthy. You have to reposition them. Well, Pastor, what's the third R? I'm glad you asked. There are these extreme circumstances where you can't retrain. And repositioning makes it worse. Because they're angry that they're no longer allowed in that space that they once occupied. So there's nothing left but to pull out the 401k. You got to retire them. You got to say, look, this is not working. And, and as much as it hurts me because I love you and I still love you. And, and I still want to maintain a connection. All right. But you just can't occupy those spaces in my life that you once occupied at all. It's tough. And it takes Jesus practiced boundaries. I was shocked at some of the people he brought into those spaces. So the Bible speaks of the multitudes. You read the multitudes, right? Yeah, you read the Gospels, and he spoke to the multitudes. That's, like they say in the, <laughs> in the Gospel church, that's everybody, everybody, everybody. The multitudes. And he would speak and interact with the multitudes and care for them. In fact, there was one multitude that was there for three days listening to his message, and he was concerned about their hunger. And it set up a miracle to feed 5,000. So he loved them, he cared for them, but they occupied a particular space that was distant and different from the other spaces that other people in his life occupied. Then there was the, the 500 that he appeared to after his resurrection. And these are individuals that he felt necessary for him to share his kingdom message. Then there were the 70. Remember the seven that he sent out? He anointed them and sent them out two by two. But then there were the 12, those who were closest to him, right? And that's the space that I was curious about 
Because he said, haven't I chosen 12 of you? And anybody reading the book? And one of you might be, is a devil. And, and, and I said to myself, well, why, do you, why would you bring the devil into such close proximity? Remember I said maturity and purpose. Purpose. Because as he spoke in his prayer in John 17 about Judas, he said, I've, of those you gave me, I've lost none except the son of perdition. In other words, this one individual who would not make the right choice, even though presented to him, he'd make the wrong choice and therefore is destined for death. Which means you're going to have people exposed to Jesus, miss the point, and miss eternal life. But I was impressed with that because the fact that he was secure enough in himself to bring Judas into that kind of space, knowing that Judas had a problem with money and greed, and then make him the treasurer. <laughs> Did you read it? He gave Jesus, Judas the bag with the money. And when I read that, I said, wait, what? But isn't that God? He'll give you what you want. Giving you the opportunity to choose what's most important to you. Him or this material world. So there was a 12. But then when he was going up to the Mount of Transfiguration, he only took three of those 12 with him. Peter, James, and John. These were the same individuals that he took into certain spaces when he was going to perform a miracle while others in the space were unbelieving. He put them out. But Peter, James, and John. But then, when Peter is asking, well, and this is after Jesus' resurrection, well, what's... what's What's going to happen to John? And Jesus says to, to, to Peter, what does that matter to you? Do what I've asked you to do, and never mind what I have planned for John. John is described as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Because when Jesus announced at the table of the Passover that someone was going to betray him, they all looked to John. Because they felt that John, because of his closest relationship to Jesus, he had an inside track, he would know. So we have the multitude, the 500, the 70, the 12, the 3, the 1. He managed spaces. And there were even spaces that his disciples didn't occupy. Because when he told them to go and get a donkey that had not been ridden on for him to make his triumphal uh, entrance into Jerusalem, he said to them, just tell the caretaker that the master has need of it. Which means he had relationships that his disciples didn't even know about. And there were times when he had to have conversations that they did not have the level of maturity and understanding for, so he would send them out to go and get lunch while he talked to the woman at the well. Spaces, boundaries. I remember my, my first trip to Zimbabwe in the 90s, and we were on the highway, and all I saw was traffic going this way and traffic coming this way. There was no lines. There were no Long white lines, no double, double yellow line. It was just the road. I, see, I saw people do things with cars that we don't do even in New York. <laughs> Zigzagging, stopping in the middle of the road to let off and pick up passengers. And when they let passengers off, the passengers got off out of the vehicle and were dodging traffic to get from the middle of the road to get to the other side. And I'm sitting there saying, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> there were no... See, boundaries are made to protect you as well as the next person. They're not designed to, or should not be designed to isolate you make you a hermit, but boundaries are important. 
So in Genesis chapter 2, verse 16, it says, God says, every tree I've given you for fruit to eat, seed bearing, I've given you, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That one you can't have. Right in the beginning, what was God doing? Establishing. So you can have all of this except that. That's amazing, we human beings. We could have all of this and want that. And when we go after that, we lose all of this. He set boundaries. What did he do? He set boundaries. So Moses, he sees this tree on fire. The bush is burning. That got his attention. But take it another step higher, the bush that was burning started talking. And what does the bush say? Of course, we know it's God manifested, and we could really break down that bush because there's so much. It's rich with metaphor. God can enter human existence with all of his power and not destroy that very existence that is inferior to that power. But he has a conversation. And he says, what did he say? Take your sandals off because the ground you're standing on is holy. Oh, you, you got that far in your Bible reading. <laughs> is what? Holy ground. In other words, the space that you're standing in, Moses, requires certain protocol. And so that you'll understand that there are boundaries between you and I, no matter how close I may bring you to me, let's start out by you taking your sandals off. And understand that when you, in, you are in my presence, all right, there's certain protocol. The ground is holy. He established boundaries of respect, honor, he made it clear that Moses should never judge him on a peer level. What was he doing? He was setting boundaries. Turn your neighbor and say, neighbor, you need some boundaries in your life. <laughs> setting boundaries in relationship is crucial for maintaining a healthy balance between personal integrity and interpersonal harmony. It means that you're going to have to take the courage, say courage, courage. to clearly communicate your needs, your limits, and your preferences in any given relationship. I'm going to write that down. You're going to have to take the time to clearly, clearly, clearly communicate your what? Your needs. What else? Limits. And what else? Right. Because there are certain things in a relationship, and every relationship is based on need. There's an exchange, right? But you want to be clear. Because when you're clear about what you need, you're also clear about what you don't need. There are boundaries. When Pastor Karen and I got married, you know, I, not even that before, before that, matter of fact, when we started dating, because we dated for three years and then got married. Uh, but when we got married, I set certain boundaries. And we agreed on those boundaries. I said, we will never disrespect each other. Especially verbally. We will maintain a certain level of language. That we will not use profanity in, in, in our home in our interaction with each other, no matter how angry we get with each other, we will shut it down and 
revisit it. But we will not allow our anger to go to the place where we are now using language as an instrument of attack, where we're weaponizing language and lowering it to the place of four-letter words and profanity. I never did like profanity because for me it was always a manifestation of a poor vocabulary. You have to resort to four letters because that's, that's the limited number of letters. Jimmy crack corn and you know the rest. Whether it's with family members, friends, romantic partners, colleagues, you have to clearly communicate the needs, limits, and preferences. Why do we need to set boundaries? Why do we need to set boundaries? I'm glad you asked me that. Number one, self-respect. Foundational, foundational to Scripture. And God said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. Did you hear that? So the image of God stamped on every human being requires dignity, worth, value, and respect. It begins with the image of God that is stamped on every human being. Now it's true that some people make it difficult for you to respect them. But there's a difference between respecting them as the individual in, a wounded, in their wounded, fallen, broken state and respecting the image of God that is stamped upon every human being. Because that's where it begins. It begins with the image of God. Boundaries help. <laughs> that clock, they don't help the clock. That clock is a boundary. <laughs> Boundaries help protect your emotional well being. Write that down. This is going to be on the test. I told you, whenever I give you stuff that's going to be on the test, expect it to be on the test. Because before you even leave this room, life is going to test you. It may use an usher. Excuse me, ma'am, you can't go there. Pasta said it's going to be tested. Boundaries help protect your emotional well-being. By not allowing others to treat you disrespectfully, harmfully, or drain you. Because self-respect is not only you demanding respect from others, but it's you respecting yourself. Because I will tell you, when you carry yourself in a certain way consistently, we're all human, we're all fall short, but when you carry yourself in a certain way consistently, all right, people will observe and they will come to certain conclusions as to what they can and cannot do in your presence. Instead of complaining and yelling, live it. Because when you live it, they see it. And they say, ah, okay. I know preachers who cuss. They're called cussing preachers. <laughs> Profanity from the pulpit. 
like one reverend told me, said, well, he cusses. I'll make you cuss. <laughs> but when you're consistent in what you do and how you carry yourself, and someone comes into your presence and they use profanity, they apologize immediately. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. How, how many know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And you don't have to verbally demand anything. You don't have to wear a sign. Respect me. Respect the space. No, it's because you've lived it out consistently in their presence. In fact, you develop a reputation that when people ask someone about you, they can tell them certain things about your consistent characteristics. <laughs> Dignity. Psalm 139, 14, just write it down. I praise you, O Lord, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. If that's true, then you need to act like it. Paul put it this way. He said, don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Not just of spirit, but Holy Spirit. Boundaries. Self-respect. And you have to be careful with this because you can take that to the extreme and become arrogant and proud. Romans 12 says, let no man think more highly of himself than he ought, but let him think soberly. Don't get drunk with pride. Because essentially self-respect is pride and dignity. One's pride and dignity in themselves. It's about honor. And you can take that to the extreme. The degree to which you respect yourself shows up in your speech. It shows up in your knowledge. It shows up in your appearances. It shows up in many, many different ways. And you're responsible for that. Did I say it's going to take courage? Because these are hard conversations. And by the looks on your faces, you already got some people in mind. <laughs> oh, yeah, this applies to so-and-so. Yeah, this applies to so -and -so. Lord, I'm going to need your help for that conversation. <laughs> but you see, if you don't establish boundaries, beginning with self-respect, then you'll be treated anyway. You'll be abused. You'll be manipulated. And people will think they can do whatever they want with you. And that's why you have to be careful to, to guard, especially as Christians, because you know we're born of Messiah, so we can have a degree of messianic complex. And feel you can save everybody. No, you can't. You're not the Savior. Jesus is. You take them to Jesus. You take them to the Savior. And here's why. Because if you think you can save everybody, the very person that needs boundaries, you will continue to allow them to occupy a space and enable them by giving them what they need and what they want to continue in self-destructive behavior. And listen, go home, pray about this introduction, because this is an introduction. We want to go through a few things. Don't leave here today checking folks. <laughs> you got holy in one service. <laughs> you elevated now. You just and forgot what you did before you were coming to church this morning. No, grow into this. This is a process. Change is a, is a process, not an event. I understand what I'm talking about. But you make a decision to begin to establish boundaries in your life in order to protect your self-respect and your self-esteem. Because when people can freely mistreat you, all right, it's, there's a question as to how you feel about yourself. And you know the definition of self-esteem. Esteem yourself. You know the definition of self-respect. Respect yourself. You have to create boundaries. And it takes courage. 
because some of the spaces are occupied by people that you love so dearly. You know, you can have a family member who's challenged with addiction or challenged with some struggle in their life. And that's a tough one because you want to be there for them. You want to love them. And you have to begin with the reality that whatever their choices are is not your fault. Not your responsibility. But you are moved by grace and wisdom to be there for them and help them the best that you can. But they must also be willing to help themselves. Amen. So we're going to begin our conversation about boundaries, the courage to set boundaries. What's this message? Courage to set boundaries. And we begin with what? Self-respect. We're going to go through a list of other things that you need to be aware of. Boundaries are here to protect you. Really, they are. And you can set boundaries in many, many even subtle ways. Subtle ways that you don't have to get into a, a verbal altercation. Primarily, but by how you conduct yourself. How you carry yourself says a lot about the degree to which people respect you. Did you get anything out of this introduction today? Come on, let's all stand. It takes courage. It takes courage. It takes courage. But if you don't set boundaries, you're going to continue to experience the stress and anxiety created by other people's issues. Let me give you a principle as we close. Are you ready? Peace is the central organizing factor for every believer. What do I mean by that? You have to be aware of the degree to which every decision you make will affect your peace. Because sometimes you, the peace has to be disturbed in order to move forward, in order to accomplish something. But you want to be aware of the degree to which that peace will be disturbed. Jesus was facing terrible things ahead of him, but he kept his peace. It was his peace that grounded him in the face of a mock trial. Betrayal, abandonment, a crucifixion. All of that he was facing, but he kept his peace. And that's a skill that you develop over time. And you say, well, can I learn that without all of the problems? We learn in traffic. Not when the road is clear. I hope you heard what I just said. That's where you learn to drive. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes as our minister comes. God bless you. I love you, family. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Pastor. Did you learn anything today, family? So we learned it takes courage to set boundaries and all relationships are spatial. People occupy certain spaces in your life with you in the center. 
We also learned something very interesting where he said, people can see you from a distance and then judge you based on their perspective. Now, I know what we learned in math class, that error increases with distance, but this time we realized that error could actually increase when you see people closer up. The beautiful thing about this is that we've learned something about decorum, and if people don't have decorum, we introduce them to what? The three R's. But more importantly, we understand that boundaries are made to create respect and honor. Jesus had boundaries. It's important that we understand that peace is the umpire for doing the will of God. And in order for us to do that, we have to be surrendered to God's hand on our lives. Today is a beautiful day. A beautiful day for us to reconcile our relationship with God. Understand that the relationships that are in our lives are there for a purpose and for a reason. But more importantly, we got to understand that we have to be tapped into God's direction for our lives. Just as Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 can tell, continue to tell us that, you know, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, your own way of thinking, but in all your ways, acknowledge him, and then he'll direct our path. So today, I'm wondering if there's anyone here today that does not know God for yourself. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm talking about have you ever reconciled your relationship with God by accepting Jesus Christ in your heart? You see, we have been blessed with a pastor's pastor who can teach and even motivate a rock. But I pray that none of us in here are those rocks. So I just want everyone to please close your eyes. If you can see me, I'm talking to you. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you today. We thank you for your word that continues to challenge us, continues to heal us, continues to show us what we're made of. Today, Lord God, we acknowledge our need for you. We ask, Lord God, that you continue to fashion us after your own heart. Continue chasing us, Lord God, with your love. Continue teaching us through your word. We cling and hold tight to the obedience that you continue to teach us about, Lord God, so that we know how to manage our way through this human experience. So today, Lord God, we give you thanks and praise. And we just ask, Lord God, if there's anyone in here that has not confessed Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, I ask that everyone please repeat after me. Dear Lord, I thank you for sending your only begotten son just for me. I pray, Lord, that you forgive me for any and every sin that I have committed. I thank you, Lord, that you sent Jesus for me. He lived, he died, and he rose again just for me. So I thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing in my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. If, if there is anyone here that has prayed that for the very first time, I'm just going to simply ask you to please raise your hand. I just want you to understand that identification is a major, major part in us being able to tap into what God has planned for us. You can lower your hands. What I want to encourage you to do is make sure that you get into a teaching church. I happen to know a good one, and I'm sure if you asked anyone around here, they would too. I also want to encourage you to tell somebody what you did today. Let them know that you gave your heart to Christ. I want you to leave here encouraged, knowing that now, Life may look different because you're seeing it from a different perspective. And ultimately, that's God's perspective. Amen? As you look around, you look at your brothers and your sisters, and you can shout hallelujah because you know that Christ is alive and well no matter what the world has to offer. Amen? 
So I think this is a beautiful time for us to part ways, but not in spirit. So if you know like I know, let's say something good as we leave this place, but never God's presence. Jesus is Lord, period. We believe it, we proclaim it, and we're seeing it come to pass. Greet your brother and sister in the Lord as you leave the building. Family, thank you so much for watching CCC's YouTube channel. If you feel what you just experienced impacted your life in any way, we encourage you to like, subscribe, and share this video with others so we can fulfill our mission in spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. We welcome you to check out some of our other videos. Also, make sure to click the notification bell so you are the first to know when we post a new one. Our praise and worship team brings us a powerful and dynamic live worship experience every Sunday. And trust me and Cameron when I say, you do not want to miss it. Streaming times are in the description box below. And if you are looking for any other information about what's happening here at CCC, visit www.cccinfo.org. We hope to see you next Sunday, but for now, continue to have a blessed week in the Lord.